Hey, what's up, eco nerdlings? In this presentation, we're going to start discussing the biogeochemical cycles of Earth, and then we're going to take an in depth look at the hydrological cycle and the carbon cycle. So let's get started. First of all, we're going to talk about the biosphere, which is where all life on Earth exists. And there are many cycles that occur in the biosphere. We have the carbon cycle, the phosphorus cycle, the nitrogen cycle, the water cycle, also called the hydrological cycle, as well as the oxygen cycle. So Earth's life support system has four major components. We have the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, the geosphere, and the biosphere. The atmosphere is subdivided into two components. We have the troposphere, which is where weather happens. That's where we have our rain and everything like that. The stratosphere, which contains the ozone layer. This is something you might have heard about on the news and things like that. There's actually holes in the ozone layer in different areas around the world, such as New Zealand. We have the hydrosphere, which is where water is found. We have our geosphere, which is where all of the solid earth is contained. And then of course, the biosphere, which is where all life is. So the natural capital or the general structure of Earth. Looking at the Earth, we have our core, our mantle, and our crust. All of those combined form the geosphere. Our atmosphere is where the air is contained. And then the hydrosphere is where we find our water on Earth. And again, the biosphere is where we locate all of the living organisms on Earth. So there are three factors that sustain life on Earth. First of all, we have a one-way flow of high-quality energy. All of the energy on Earth originates from the sun. So the sun gives its energy to plants, which gives its energy to other living things, such as our consumers, which in turn gives their energy away to the environment in the form of heat. That heat is then radiated into space. We also have the cycling of nutrients through parts of the biosphere, and we have gravity, which holds the atmosphere together. These are the three factors that sustain life on Earth. So again, one-way flow of energy, cycling of nutrients, and gravity holding that atmosphere together. So sun, earth, life, and climate. Our sun is responsible for all types of radiation, visible and non-visible. Radiation on Earth, it can be absorbed by the ozone and other atmospheric gases, it can be absorbed and reflected by the Earth, and it's radiated by the atmosphere's heat. So we have a lot of exchange of radiation. And this creates a natural greenhouse gas effect. Again, that's probably a term you've heard in the past, greenhouse effect, what's going on with that? So looking at the diagram again, we have all kinds of different radiations coming from the sun, being radiated back out into space, uh, being radiated from the atmosphere into space, or from the earth into space, from space into the atmosphere. So all kinds of radiation uh, going on, being reflected, as well as absorbed. So what happens to matter in an ecosystem? Well, matter in the form of different types of nutrients cycles through our biosphere and within and among ecosystems. So human activities are actually altering some of these biogeochemical cycles, and not in a very positive way either. Nutrient cycle in the biosphere, and we have different types of biogeochemical cycles which help to cycle all of these nutrients. We have the hydrological or water cycle, carbon cycle, nitrogen cycle, phosphorus cycle, and the sulfur cycle. Nutrients can remain in a reservoir for a very long period of time as well. So like the carbon cycle, we have our reservoirs in the bottom of the oceans that are held by limestone that basically keep all of this carbon in there until it's eventually released. So the first cycle we're going to get in depth with is the hydrological or water cycle. We have a natural renewal of water quality, and there are three major processes that contribute to this. We have evaporation of water. So if you think about it, if you have water and you kind of spread it on your hand, eventually it's going to evaporate back out into the atmosphere. We have precipitation, which occurs in the form of rain, snow, sleet, hail, and then we have transpiration. Transpiration might be one of those words that you're kind of like, I've heard it, but I don't really know what it is. So plants transpire through their stomata. So water goes up through the roots into the vascular system of the plants, the stomata open, and it releases water in the form of water vapor and we call this process transpiration. We have an alteration of the hydrologic cycle by humans. 
So we've altered it and impacted the water cycle in a very negative way. We withdraw extremely large amounts of fresh water at much faster rates than it can be produced. We clear vegetation and in turn this causes huge flooding problems in wetlands. So one of these huge floods occurred in China where all of the farmers had basically cleared this forest to plant their rice crops. Whenever they did this, the rains came and instead of the trees soaking up the water, all of the rain basically just came washing down the mountains and completely flooded the town because they had destroyed the natural environment and in turn they had a huge flooding that occurred. So looking at an in-depth diagram of the water cycle as well as the human uh, impacts that have impacted the water cycle in a harmful way. So we have our ocean which is one of our largest sources of water. We can't really utilize that as far as drinking water but that's where most of the water on earth is contained is the oceans. We also have lakes and streams. We have our aquifers or groundwater. We have precipitation, so we'll start there. So water precipitates down in the form of rain, snow, sleet, or hail. So precipitation can occur on land or it can occur over the ocean. So precipitation on land occurs somewhere and eventually some of that water will percolate and infiltrate into an aquifer. So it goes through soil, it goes through the clay, and it goes through all of the pebbles and the rocks and eventually down into an aquifer. While humans use these aquifers, and unfortunately we have a very large overpumping of them, using that water to irrigate crops as well as for fresh water for us to use in drinking water, toilet water, you name it, we're using it. Um, we also have increased runoff of land covered by crops and buildings as well as pavement. And again, runoff, which is increased from cutting forests and filling wetlands. One of the main problems with all of this runoff is that a lot of times it occurs where we've planted crops. And when we plant crops, we use fertilizer. So all of those harmful nitrates, phosphates, as well as all kinds of pesticides that we use to prevent our crops from being destroyed goes into our water cycle. So it damages a lot of plant life, it damages a lot of uh, living organisms in the ocean, it can cause harmful algal blooms, it can poison different fish species, and it can actually go up into the food chain and start to affect us eventually. You might have heard of mercury poisoning and things like that for people that eat some of the larger fishes. Well, all of that is due to the accumulation of toxins in the water, and it goes up the food chain. So again, we have our runoff uh, into the water, and then we have evaporation. Evaporation can occur on land as well as the ocean or water. Evaporation releases water vapor into the atmosphere. And then we also have transpiration from plants. Remember, they're stomata open and release water vapor up into the atmosphere. And eventually, all of this condenses and we have precipitation coming down once again. So one of the main reservoirs of fresh water are stored in glaciers. So these are some different types of glaciers. This one is the Mendenhall Glacier. I had to throw this one in there. This is me climbing the Mendenhall Glacier. Uh, but that's one of our reservoirs for fresh water. And again, a lot of glaciers, you hear the polar ice caps are melting because of global warming. So of course this is becoming a very large concern. So why is water so important? Well, water is very important because it has very many unique properties. The number one property probably of water is that it's called the universal solvent. It's a polar molecule and many, many, many substances can be dissolved by water. And most of these properties of water are due to the hydrogen bonds that exist between the water molecules themselves. Water can exist in a liquid, a solid, or a gas. It changes temperatures very slowly, so it has a very high heat capacity. It has a high boiling point, and it has forces such as adhesion and cohesion. So think about adhesion as an adhesive. If I have a piece of tape and I stick it to something, I want to tape a piece of paper onto a wall. That's called an adhesive, sticking one thing to another. So that would be like water sticking to the side of a glass. That would be an example of adhesion. Cohesion would be the water sticking to other water molecules through hydrogen bonding. Water also expands as it freezes. And again, it's called the universal solvent. It also filters out very harmful UV radiation. So these are some examples of hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen, like I said, is a polar molecule. 
So the oxygen atom has a tendency to have a slightly negative charge, while the two hydrogen atoms over here have a positive charge, which creates a polar molecule. And we have hydrogen bonding that forms these water molecules. That's why water molecules have a surface tension or why water has a surface tension. And you can see very small insects that can actually walk on top of the water because of those forces that are holding water molecules together. So the next cycle that we're going to look at is the, let me find it, carbon cycle right here. So the carbon cycle depends solely on photosynthesis and respiration. Um, well, not solely, but very, very uh, deeply. So the link between photosynthesis and producers, as well as respiration, producers, consumers, and decomposers drastically affects the carbon cycle. That's what it's all about, the cycling of carbon in our uh, world. So the addition of carbon dioxide added to the atmosphere can occur through tree clearing, meaning we go in and we clear all of the trees in a forest because we want to use them to build houses or burn, make flooring, that type of thing. Uh, so whether it's a rainforest or a deciduous forest, we're going to be clearing all of the trees, which obviously takes out organisms that utilize that carbon dioxide and produce oxygen. We have burning of fossil fuels that contribute to the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and this causes the atmosphere to warm. So our two main formulas that you need to know for photosynthesis and aerobic respiration are as follows. In photosynthesis, we take carbon dioxide from respiration and water, we use energy from the sun and reproduce this guy right here, C6H12O6, which is called glucose. And importantly as well, we also produce oxygen. We need oxygen to breathe and to function. We also have aerobic respiration. In aerobic respiration, we take the product of photosynthesis, which is glucose and oxygen, and we create carbon dioxide and water. But most importantly, we create energy in the form of ATP. So again, photosynthesis, we take carbon dioxide, water, and we use energy from the sunlight to create glucose and oxygen. Oxygen is used as the final electron acceptor in the uh, cellular respiration, but you don't need to know that for this class. Um, and then we take that product of photosynthesis, again, our glucose and our oxygen, and we use it in respiration, and we produce the carbon dioxide and water, and again, energy in the form of ATP. So taking an in-depth look in the carbon cycle, as well as the harmful human impacts of carbon dioxide. So, as you can see, there are a lot of arrows pointing up here, to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Oh, there we go. So we have carbon dioxide released by plants. We have carbon dioxide released by forest fires, by fossil fuels, deforestation, uh, transportation. So all of our cars and our trucks are releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Uh, carbon is actually released by plants as well because plants respire just as they can uh, conduct photosynthesis they also go through cellular respiration and release carbon dioxide. We have our burning of fossil fuels. Uh, and then if you see right here, we have a very small arrow right here that's taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And that are, that's all of our plants that are using carbon dioxide for the process of photosynthesis. So if you look at this, we have all of these arrows going into creating carbon dioxide and only one that's taking carbon dioxide out. And one of the things we're doing is removing plants, which is in turn increasing the levels of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. All of the red arrows that you see are causes of carbon dioxide as a result of humans. So we have our transpiration, deforestation, forest fires that are created by us. Huge one is the burning of fossil fuels. So the effects of human activities on the carbon cycle. Obviously, we alter the carbon cycle drastically by adding excess carbon dioxide into the atmosphere through our burning of fossil fuels, clearing of vegetation as fast, uh, excuse me, faster than it is replaced. So if you look at this graph here, this is kind of a projection of where the carbon dioxide emissions are going. So we started off in 1850 uh, with very, very low carbon dioxide output into the environment. 
And as we got to our industrial revolution, uh, transportation came into being, we had lots of cars, trucks, all of these things, burning of fossil fuels, you see pretty much an exponential growth of the release of carbon dioxide into the, into the environment. Uh, we have our high projection right here and our low projection, which is still high, of what's going to happen if we continue at the rate that we are. And this is something that you guys and your generation is going to have to worry about. And you guys are going to be the ones that need to start coming up with solutions of how we're going to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide into the environment. Uh, you will be responsible for figuring out how are we going to have more um, environmentally friendly transportation? Are we going to be able to make an electric car work? And are we going to be able to overcome all of the politics and things like that that go with reducing carbon into the atmosphere? So something you guys should think about. Well, I hope that was helpful. You can rewatch this video lecture and find many more at www.nerdlingscience.com. Well, this is the Queen Nerdling signing out for now. Stay nerdy till next time.